we have talked about research as it pertains to fiction and that you really need to research. We also talked about how you need to do your research so that you can be sensitive, especially if you're writing fantasy, to the parts of fantasy that actually come from different cultures so that you don't find yourself creating an insensitive situation. But today... We are going to be talking about Avatar The Last Airbender on Writing in the Tiny House. Hello, 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 and welcome to today's episode. Welcome to Writing in the Tiny House. I am your host, Devin Davis, and I am the guy in a tiny house in northern Utah who shares with you the things about writing, about how to do it, how to do the things. Up until very recently, the whole point of this podcast was to show you all the parts of a system so that you can do a short story in as little as three months or a novel in as little as 18 months, but still have the wherewithal to adjust that timeline if you need to. But, and I still need to give myself some time to think about kind of a more precise way to put this. I, from now on out, am going to be tackling the idea of the tortured artist. So it still feeds into what I was talking about earlier about having a system and being armed so that your system can work and you don't get confused and you don't get disheartened. But really, I am out to get rid of the idea of the tortured artist. I do not feel that art naturally comes from torture or from complication or from having a hard, complicated relationship with your work in progress, I think that we can do away with the idea that suffering goes hand in hand with art. And instead, with some knowledge and with some practice, we can instead empower each other in order to become better creators and bring out more amazing content every year. So that is what the new mission of this podcast will be. But like I said, I'm going to take a second to kind of hone that in and refine that and become more precise in how I actually want to say it. Today is a special day because we are going to be talking about Avatar The Last Airbender, which by far is one of the very most successful productions ever done by Nickelodeon. The first season came out in 2005. It is three seasons, a mixture of about 60 episodes, I think. It has become a very iconic part of any type of animated content. Just with the research with the bending, it's all modeled after different forms of martial arts. The magic, if you want to call it a magic system, takes place with people having talents that they can manipulate specific elements, specifically earth, water, fire, air. And the way that they do that, the way that it is shown in the animated series, they take the styles of different forms of martial arts and mix it in with all of that so that it creates a really cool effect. It's one of the very best animated series ever. And it is still talked about on social media. There are still people like the personality quizzes of like, which element would you bend or whatever else? It is fantastic. And it mixes in a bunch of Eastern philosophy and a bunch of Eastern thought with the themes of the show. And so as they were creating, as the creators of Avatar The Last Airbender were creating this world, they brought in a lot of different cultures all over, like I said, the eastern part of the world. There is a lot of homage to Japanese culture. There's a lot of homage to Hinduism. There's just a lot of things. It doesn't reference those things directly because it is a different world. However, they bring in some cool things in order to create a certain amount of familiarity and a certain feeling of time and space. And it's great. Back in 2020, when I caught COVID, 
and the quarantine at that time was 14 days and I was with my kids and we had just moved into the tiny house and we got to quarantine in place in the tiny house where we had not lived before for 14 days and we didn't have a TV. We had to watch TV on my computer, on my laptop. We burned through all three seasons of Avatar The Last Airbender, and my boys loved it. And I would love to do that marathon again someday. So with all of that, the main, or at least one of the main issues, and there's always an issue with any form of world or any form of a thing where you are creating a completely new way of life. And it, and like I said, Avatar The Last Airbender is many cultures. It's not just one place. It is all spread out throughout an entire world. And whenever a person or whenever, you know, a, a group of creators goes to do that, there's always something that kind of doesn't work out very well. And one of the main complaints is the size of the world itself. So because it is a fantasy thing, there, of course, is a flying bison that everybody kind of gets around on from place to place named Appa. And if we can assume that Appa flies at a comfortable 40 to 50 miles per hour, just, just guessing, I'm sure that Appa doesn't fly faster than that. He can get from one end of the world to the other end of the world, I think in a day, which makes that whole world pretty teeny tiny. They can get from the South Pole to the North Pole in really not a lot of time at all. I mean, granted, with flying, you can get anywhere a lot faster. But one of the main critiques about Avatar The Last Airbender is the size of the world itself, that it is completely circumnavigatable in a very short amount of time. And instead of selecting a region or calling it a region of a world, they always call it the whole world. And you can see the entire map of the world in the opening credits of each of the episodes of the program. And and so today we are going to be talking about the realities of geography, just because especially if you are doing a really big, complicated story with a lot of people who are living in different places of the world, different geographical locations, and if they need to march versus if they need to walk versus if they need to ride a horse, it is always a good idea to make a map to identify some of the different landmarks in that map, like if there is a big mountain or a mountain range, odds are they are going to go around the mountain if they can. And like I said, people get places faster if they are on a horse versus if they are walking or getting somewhere in a small group versus if they are a really large marching army bringing a lot of supplies. Those circumstances travel in different ways. Same goes with sailing. If you are in a sailboat, you are not going to get anywhere nearly as fast as if you are in a more modern boat with an engine. And it is interesting to do your research on sailing. Sailboats don't actually go as fast as you might imagine. And to get anywhere in one day, and like it's it's just important to get the scope of the area that you want to include in your novel and to present it in a completely believable way. Sometimes what we end up doing is we unintentionally cause our characters to teleport from here to there. And we don't take into account the travel. That doesn't mean that you have to narrate the travel, but it does mean that you need to allow for it. You need to allow the amount of time that it takes to get from, you know, southern Utah to northern Utah if you are going by horse. Or if you are sailing what would be equivalent to the entire coast of California and arrive in a couple days or in a few days versus in one day or later that day. So this is where you just need to envision and really work out the geography of your world. So recently, we were reading a thing and some details stood out 
that I thought would be a, a good demonstration or a good way to show what we mean. So in this particular story, there was an explosion on the beach and there is a town on the beach. So it's just a, a little sleepy beachside town, not like a big major city, like a big port or a big trading area of the world, just a little sleepy city on the coast. Now, it is, in the story itself, the explosion was big enough that everybody in the city noticed it. So, that automatically suggests a couple different things. First of all, it had to have been a very big explosion. Also, it was probably a much smaller city. Also, the city must have literally been right up to the beach. And all of that works if all of it is present. If we take the same situation and let's say that there is an explosion on the beach, but only like a small group of people know. Maybe some of the kids are playing on the beach and cause something to explode. Who knows? Maybe they're playing with explosives or with like a new toy that has a battery that goes bad or something. If it is imperative to the narrative, imperative to the narrative, there's a thing that you can say to yourself. If it is imperative that nobody sees the explosion that all of that is kind of hidden, then a couple things need to be true. The explosion must have been pretty small, or it must have been pretty secluded. Perhaps there was something obstructing the vision of this or obstructing the sound. Perhaps they were not right in town. Perhaps they weren't right at the part of town that is on the beach. Maybe they were a few miles north or south or just kind of away from it. Perhaps the town is not right on the beach. Perhaps the town itself is five miles away from the beach and these kids rode their bikes to get to the beach. Any of those things would make it believable that nobody heard the explosion. When you have events like this, make sure that your story is set up to make it all believable. Like I said, with the story that I mentioned that brought all of this to, to light, a, a really big explosion on the beach of a city that goes up to the beach was noticed by everybody, and so it totally worked. It was also in the middle of the day, which also worked. If it was in the middle of the night, there's a possibility that a lot of the town may not have really noticed it or may not have found out until a day or two later what was actually happening. I mean, there's always there's always a caveat. There's always something to figure out. This is the importance of research and geography. Make sure, number one, that you are understanding the speed by which the people are traveling. If you have a lot of wizards and they can just teleport here and there, or you have the technology to do that, then absolutely do that. That's super great. However, just the take home is if they are traveling in small groups, if they are on horses, if they are a big marching army with a lot of supplies like tents and food to feed the army and full armor and all the things, they travel at different rates. Also flying versus like flying in a jet, like flying on a flying bison <laughs> versus flying in an airplane versus a bird or a giant eagle or whatever other reference we want to pull into flying on a dragon. All of those things travel differently. Sailing travels differently. So just make sure that you have your map and that you understand kind of the distance between the different places where people need to go and account for the travel time in your narration. Like I said, you don't need to narrate the entire travel time if it's super boring and it will make your book too long and boring, or it's not going to add to the plot at all, but you need to account for it. Say like it took three, it took three days to get there, or it took six weeks to get there or whatever. There are a million ways to do it. So that is it for today's episode. So just a, a little small note before I close the episode. Last week, I did a bonus episode on pride and I am going to do one more episode. I don't think it's going to be a bonus episode. It's going to be a mainstream thing documenting what my experience in Pride has been and how it pertains to the creative mind. So it's still 100% will apply to this podcast. And I'm going to make it 
on just the normal release schedule of these different episodes. And yeah, this episode that you just finished is the final episode of our little three-part thing on research in fiction. And we're going to wrap it up here. The layout of the future episodes might be a little bit different. So pay attention to that and that'll be okay, right? So anyway, thank you for joining me and we will see you at the next episode. And that is it for today. Just a reminder that Brigitte, installment one of Tales from Vlador, is available on Amazon as an ebook and on Audible and Apple Books as an audiobook. And I provide advanced reader copies of these short stories as I release them to my patrons. So become a patron today by visiting patreon.com slash writing in the tiny house to support both my writing and this podcast. And lastly, be sure to follow me on social media. My Instagram is at author Devin Davis and my Twitter handle is at author Devin D. Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and have fun writing. We will see you next time. Run by copy editor Chrissy Barton. Little Syllables Editing is a reliable resource for anyone looking to improve their manuscript. Chrissy does line edits, copy edits, and the final proofread for experienced writers and newbies alike. Go to littlesyllables.com and reach out to Chrissy today. A link is in the show notes.